from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Richard Holmes is best known as the world's preeminent biographer of the Romantic era poets. He not only tells the tales of these writers, he absorbs their lives. He projects a romantic sensibility. His two-volume biography of Coleridge has been called a near masterpiece of empathy. But after studying the Romantic era for years, Holmes realized something. There was a powerful, largely overlooked influence on the Romantic culture and on the writers of the time. And that influence was science. He explores this theme in his new book, The Age of Wonder, how the Romantic generation discovered the beauty and terror of science. Holmes was born in London and educated at Churchill College, Cambridge. He began his career as a journalist. For 20 years, he was a feature writer and a reviewer for the London Times. His first book, Shelley, The Pursuit, was published in 1974 and won the Somerset Mom Prize. That was followed by his first volume on Coleridge. Next came an account of the friendship between Samuel Johnson and the poet Richard Savage. He's also written two volumes of memoirs focusing on the craft of biography. One reviewer has described his latest, The Age of Wonder, as a big-hearted river of a book in which the twin engines of scientific curiosity and poetic invention pulsate on every page. In Holmes's view, Romantic era scientists and poets shared a vision. Both held to the hope for human improvement. Coleridge believed that science had a poetic side because it too had a passion for hope. Some observers believe Holmes's newest book has a lesson for us today. It can serve as a model for bringing the sciences and the arts together so we can all grasp the beauty and terror of modern life. Holmes might agree, for he has said, scientific breakthroughs promise benefits, but also raise fears. It was such in the Romantic era, and it is so today. Please join me in welcoming Richard Holmes. I'd just like to introduce Susie, who is our signer today. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've just flown in from London, where I'm the only man in the tent wearing a suit. I probably will take it off later on. Right? Uh, and I'm tremendously grateful to two major institutions, of course, the Library of Congress, which I want to say something about, and also the Washington Post, which I want to say something about. But there's a third institution, and this requires me to put this hat on. And you can't read it, but it says, Junior League of Washington. And they are the young ladies who at the signing in have been looking after you in the hats, the white and the black hats and they've just elected me the only male member of the Junior League of Washington. And the point about them, you, many of you will know, they do wonderful work helping people challenge in their reading abilities of all ages, all right? Um, and they go fund gathering, and if you want to help them, go straight onto the net. It's jlw.com and make a contribution because that is one of the major themes, as I understand it, of the festival. Books, reading, helping people to read. So that's JLB, the JLW. Ah, uh, I have to say, I had a certain disappointment arriving here in Washington because I understood that it was traditional that the rain poured down. <laughs> you probably, some of you wish the rain was pouring down. Right? But it was, I had a special joke arranged for this, um, which I'm going to tell anyway, all right? Um, which is to do with writing. And some of you have made, been to the big festival in England, in Wales, in fact, the Hay on Wye Literary Festival. And there, traditionally, also the rain pours down. So to get to the tent, you have to wade through mud, okay? And this was happening to me two or three years ago. 
And just as I got to the tent, remember this is in Wales, a voice called out, and you'll have to do this with a Welsh accent. <laughs> Fine weather for biographers. <laughs> and then he added, plenty of feet of clay. <laughs> very, very true. So, nonetheless, I'm very glad that it's shining today. Um, I wanted to say this about the Library of Congress, which is uh, one of your great national institutions. For the first time, I had a chance to get to see it. Um, and one of the things I came away with was the Jefferson, the Thomas Jefferson Library. Um, it's so impressive, partly because it's small. It's not too monumental. It's possible to have it in probably a room and a half. And Jefferson organized his library under three headings, not Dewey organization. He organized it under memory, reason, and imagination. And I thought about this, and I thought that roughly defines the task of a writer like me. For memory, we are going back into history to discover, and particularly the history of science in this case. Reason, we try to understand and explain the science that has been done in the past, and imagination, we try to bring it to life. So for me, those uh, co Jeffersonian concepts, memory, reason, imagination, very, very important. When I arrived at Customs and Immigration, the officer looked very carefully at me and then said, Professor Holmes, what is the purpose of your visit? <laughs> now, have you understood this right? The purpose of your visit. This seemed to me like a metaphysical question. <laughs> like, what is the purpose of the universe? <laughs> and I hardly noticed him stamping my thing and sending me out, okay? Um, so in the way, uh, that's what I want to talk about in these very few minutes the purpose of the visit, the purpose of writing. I've incidentally, I was told that um, I should spend 20 minutes not talking about my book, and then 10 minutes answering questions about not talking about my book. <laughs> so we'll see how we get on with that. So I thought I'd do this in this shape or form. Um, I'm going to use questions that people have actually asked me in the very brief time I've been here. And the first one was, uh, Mr. Holmes, did you come from London by hot air balloon? Uh, it, uh, it's something to do with the cover of the book. Uh, to which my quick answer was, well, the first hot air balloon that crossed the Atlantic from England to America was described by none other than Edgar Allan Poe in the New York Sun in 1844. Three English pilots, including the famous Charles Green, and they overflew Greenland and they landed on the shores somewhere, I think in Massachusetts. This was the biggest scoop the New York Sun had ever had. And then Ed Graham Poe realized and revealed that it was a complete hoax. They'd never crossed the Atlantic. It was the first of his stories of mystery and imagination. That was in 1844. But the first person who flew the English Channel, it was an uh, English balloon, but the pilot was an American, Dr. John Jeffries. So that's a little bit of history, which appears in my book. And the first woman aeronaut was an actress, Mrs. Sage. And she has a great comic turn in my book. And at the end of this week coming, I am going, so it's maybe the last you ever see of me, to the International Balloon Fiesta in New Mexico <laughs> to fly with the winner of the American Hot Air Challenge Cup. Bye-bye. <laughs> Second question, can you remember your long subtitle? All right. Um, in fact, it's amazing. I just noticed it's not on the cover of the book. OK, anyway, the long subtitle is How the Romantic Generation Discovered the Beauty and Terror of Science. And that is, in a way, my first serious point, because 
This is a history of 18th century science, but the notion that science is both beautiful and threatening and menacing is a key idea to grasp and one that we have absolutely inherited. And one of the themes of my book is to see how this began in Europe and in England uh, in the late 18th century. Um, I'll give you one example of this. That uh, There's a, a passage, a chapter describing the invention of the miner's safety lamp, which I'm sure some of you learned about in school by the chemist Humphrey Davy. Uh, a brilliant piece of invention, which I tried to describe, which prevented the deep mine explosions of methane. A beautiful invention, benefit to mankind. But what happened? As a result of that lamp, miners were sent deeper and deeper into the mines, and gradually the casualties grew again. So there's a double-edged sword, and that would be an example. There are others, but that's just one for the book. Question, would you describe your book differently to a science graduate or an arts graduate? Hmm. To a science graduate, I would say this book weighs 0.958 kilograms. <laughs> it's five centimeters thick. It's 485 pages long. It's got 72 footnotes, and it's got 306 lines of poetry in it, which is the point they begin to look skeptical. <laughs> How would I describe it to an arts graduate? Well, I'd say this is a group biography, and it takes a particular period between Captain Cook's first navigation of the globe, 1768, and Charles Darwin setting out in 1831 the famous voyage to the Galapagos Islands. So it's that period of time, about 60 years, and it emphasizes the friendship and the contact and the letter writing and the inspiration that moved between literary writers and poets and the scientists of the period. Now, sometimes people say, are you sure, are you sure about this? Let me give you one single proof. Um, and I want to read a poem. I promised myself I'd read a poem. And this, let me set it up. First of all, it's by a woman poet. And this is, again, a very important theme of the kind of history I'm writing, is I think that women have been written out of the history of science, certainly in the 18th and 19th century. And I think there's a lot of recovery to do. And this poem is by Anna Barbold. And she was working as an assistant to Joseph Priestley, who, as you know, uh, his um, laboratory was burnt down, and he came here to the land of the free, it's Philadelphia, and he worked there for the final years of his life. This went, was when he was still in England, and he was doing experiments with a vacuum. Um, some of you may have seen the famous picture by Joseph Wright of Derby, which is a bird fluttering in a big glass vacuum tube. And the idea was to experiment with what was the mysterious gas in the tube that kept the bird, the dove, alive. And Priestley, in fact, was on the trail of oxygen. He used all kinds of animals, and one was a mouse. So he had a laboratory mouse. And Anna Barbold began to worry not so much about oxygen, but about the mouse. And so she wrote a poem which was called The Mouse's Petition to Dr. Priestley, found in the cage where he had been confined all night, by which we understand the mouse, not Dr. Priestley. <laughs> so you have to imagine that just like today, experimental cage, this mouse was scheduled to undergo the oxygen chest the following day. And when Priestley came down, he found this poem. I just want to quote a couple of lines from this. Um, and this is Anna Barbold, who was very well read in science, but suddenly putting herself in the place of the non-volunteering mouse. And this is what the mouse says to the scientists. For here forlorn and sad I sit within the wiry grate and tremble at the approaching morn, which brings impending fate. The cheerful light the vital air are blessings widely given. Let nature's commoners enjoy the common gifts of heaven. The well-taught philosophic mind to all compassion gives. 
and cast around the world an equal eye and feels for all that lives. So there is possibly the first animal rights poem, right? <laughs> and very interesting that it came out of this scientific laboratory in 18, 1773. And that's a, uh, just one tiny example of the thing that happens throughout my book and what interests me so much is the connection between the writer, the literary writer, and the scientist. Um, question, why did you change after writing, after working for 40 years on literary biography to science biography? I felt there was a slight tone of reproach in that question. Why did, why did you do that? Um, the quick answer is I'd written about the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the one who took the opium, you remember, Kubla Khan? And it turned out that as a young man, his great friend was Humphrey Davy, who was going to be the greatest chemist of the age and become president of the Royal Society. And I discovered when Davy was experimenting with a new kind of gas, nitrous oxide, which is also called laughing gas, he called for volunteers. And amazingly, among them, hot from his opium experiments, was the 24-year-old Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So you have to imagine the scientist and the poet breathing in the nitrous oxide and then dancing, knocking people over in the street, writing poetry under the influence. It's all there in the book and it's there in the notebooks. So that friendship made me think, if that's Coleridge and Davy, the poet and the scientist, maybe there's a much bigger story there. So that was one of the things that set me off. I should also say I had an amazing chance when I started to write this book, I got a, um, a summer fellowship at Trinity College, Cambridge, and that is, Trinity is the great, it's Newton's college, it's the great scientific college uh, in England. And it, there you, um, when you dine, I was there for six months, you just sit anywhere on the table, okay? There, there's long tables, there's no place, you don't know who you're gonna sit next to. And I have to say, in the time I was there, there were six Nobel Prize winners and I sat next to each of them, and it was very interesting to try and ask them questions. And one of the things I found is that unlike many literary professors, the scientists loved explaining things, and they were really good at doing it. And that was something that fascinated and converted me. And I, let me give you one pure example of this, that I sat down one evening next to a Russian mathematician who spoke no English at all, and the one thing I knew is that he knew about Everest Galois, the great romantic mathematician. So that was the one thing I could, I turned to him, I said, Everest Galois. And this wonderful smile spread across his face. And then he leaned across the table, managed this college table with all the silverware, all right, good thing. And he drew all the silverware over him, and he began to lay out an algebraic box with the knives and the forks and the pepper. And he explained, without using any words, Everest Galois' theory. Uh, it caused chaos. Uh, the waiters had to come and intervene in the end, OK? But <laughs> and that was just one wonderful example. And that changed me. I thought, this is something to, to meet people like that. It's something I must write about. Question. Are scientists madder than poets? Um, the answer is it's fully explored in my book. The answer is um, no and yes, sir. <laughs> and the story of William Caroline Herschel, again, I emphasize Caroline Herschel, two astronomers, brother and sister, a kind of William and Dorothy Wordsworth of astronomy, is extraordinary, very passionate, very interesting relationship. Um, full um, of ups and downs and extraordinary exchanges. Caroline became the first really efficient uh, woman astronomer of the period, in fact, got a government uh, pension. And she did a wonderful thing. She kept a journal, just like Dorothy Wordsworth, of William Herschel's observations. Uh, and they are there in the archive, and it's something I was able to use. I have to say, the first page, they were both from Hanover, was written in German. I thought my luck was out. And then from then on, as she was working in England, she wrote in English. Uh, so their story shows a kind of passion which I would, is certainly uh, as bright and strong as anything of the poets. 
Question, did you get any fan letters? Well, I got a fan letter from NASA. And they pointed out that in the footnote on page 295, where I uh, de described the Hubble telescope, I had got one figure, 0.01% out. But as it referred to the cost of the Hubble, they were not pleased. Um, I also um, had a wonderful form of fan letter, which is relevant now, from Harold Baumus, who's the uh, Nobel Prize winner in medicine, who's going to be talking immediately after me in another tent, um, who said that he'd recommended my book to the freshmen of Amherst College. And the result is I think it broke the bank because um, the department had to buy 459 copies of it, all right? So that's the kind of fan letter you really like, all right? Um, special story telling methods, yes, one is to keep to length and to keep to time, which I'm rapidly running out from. Um, but let me describe one thing in the book. It's the use of the vertical footnote. Everybody asks me, what's a vertical footnote? The main body of the story you tell is in chronological time. But continually, you want to drop out of that time and go back to what happened before or go forward to see the influence, hence a footnote which describes the Hubble telescope. So that's one technique in a way that um, I felt I pioneered slightly in using literary methods to describe scientific effects, the vertical footnote. What are you going to write next? I don't have to answer that question. So that rapidly moves us on to the tenth <laughs> and the last. And this is this. Uh, I think I've got two more minutes. Um, the other institution that is responsible for being here is the Washington Post, which I have huge respect for. And they ask this question, which is um, a serious one. Can writers change the world? And I just want to finish with the draft of the um, piece I sent them, a little blog about this. I have a literary Irish aunt, a fiery fan of James Joyce, who once dismissed this question with a snort of derision. Sign in Irish. <laughs> Writers don't have to change the world. Sure, it's changing fast enough anyway. They should try and slow it down instead, or maybe make it go backwards. So considering this response, I've slightly reformulated the question, when did people stop believing that writers could or should change the world? Because up to the mid-19th century in Europe, this was an automatic assumption, part of the Enlightenment project, central to the idea of progress. Knowledge is power, said Francis Bacon. In 1820, the poet Shelley, who I've written about, could still hopefully say, poets and philosophers are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Though I have to tell you, the later poet, W.H. Auden, said, well, that makes writers sound rather like secret policemen. Okay, that's true. But Shelley's exact contemporary, Humphrey Davy, who I've mentioned, he put a different view, and this is something I want to leave you with. Um, it wasn't writers, but maybe it was the scientists who were changing the world. And he said, if you compared Shakespeare or Francis Bacon, Milton or Newton, who would you think had changed the world more? Very interesting question. And I think there is an answer now which says from the 20th century with penicillin, air travel, nuclear power, 21st century, mobile phone, internet, climate change, etc. That might be the proper response. But then I think writers have inherited a new form of this question. Is it change for the better or for the worse? Is our world the kind we want, or the kind we should have, or the kind we have foolishly lost? Do we have reasons to hope or to fear, to dream and wonder, or simply to laugh at the absurdity of the whole thing? By posing such questions and exploring all possible answers, writers are no longer asked to change the world. They are asked continually to reimagine it 
which is a far more radical request. But I'm not sure that my Joycean aunt would approve all the same. Thank you very much. I think we've got time for just a couple of questions. Are there any in the romantic uh, generation that today you believe would be or could be or should be scientifically, clinically categorized as manic depressive, bipolar, uh, schizophrenic, and or in some other category of mental illness? Okay. Uh, yes, there's been a whole thesis written about this, the uh, mental or bipolar thing of writers or scientists. Um, my answer to that would be no, but it, what is very, very noticeable with someone like Davy or the Herschels or Mungo Park the Explorer is a kind of recklessness, a passionate recklessness that they would push and sacrifice themselves to find the truth, to pursue their science. I'll give you one example from Davy, and you can tell me if you think this is um, manic depressive or not. When he was testing those gases, they didn't know what they were, he inhaled um, carbon monoxide. It's one now used for committing suicide in the car in the backyard, okay? That gas, they didn't know it. And he inhaled it, and he virtually killed himself. He came back, and he re-inhaled it, and he wrote, as he was breathing, his pulse rate, his visionary distortions, and this note, I do not think I shall die. Now, what kind of extremism is that? And that happens again and again at this period. And it's a kind of recklessness with which I think science is still driven. So that's my slightly digressive answer. I reckon we got, have we got one more minute? One more minute, one more question, sir. I'd be interested in your view of Stephen Hawking as scientist and as popular writer. His new book is selling like hotcakes here and in England and I'd be interested in your reaction to him. Okay, you should have asked that 25 minutes ago. <laughs> Very good question, okay. Uh, the new book is called The Grand Design, um, and it's become controversial partly because it sounds like an atheist tract, all right? That's one of the problems there. This is what I'd say about that book. Uh, it's a problem that begins in the 19th century that more and more science is expressed in terms of pure mathematics. And pure mathematical setups are very difficult to imagine or visualize. And when you get to string theory or M theory, it is very difficult to know, is the scientist speculating or is it something that can be proved? And I think that's a very, very big dilemma. And I just finally add one more thing, very important, which I call displacement. And this bears on the two cultures. One of the things that's happened since Copernicus removed the Earth from the center of the solar system and said it was the sun, Science has displaced us more and more in terms of time, how small we are in terms of the universe, how irrelevant we are to a quantum universe, that is to say the very, very small, and also to the very, very big, and also in terms of time and evolution. We seem to occupy a more and more displaced space. And yet at the same time, we are developing beautiful theories and we are writing and we are here today. And I think there is the division between the science culture displacing us and the literary culture trying to put us back and put meaning into everything around us. There's the difference and that's my time. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.